Hi, whether you're a first time YouTube guest or a long time member of our church, First Baptist Pulaski welcomes you. You know, our church family is messy. We are flawed. We have issues. We have sinned and fallen way short of what God desires and requires. But much of what motivates our worship is gratitude. See, God didn't leave us hopelessly wallowing around in the mud of our sin. No, He saw our need to be clean and sent His Son Jesus to take on human flesh, live the perfect life we could not, offer Himself on a cross as payment for our sins, and then rise victoriously from the dead. As Psalm 40 suggests, God lifted us up from the muck and mire, set our feet firmly on the rock of His Son, and put a new song of praise in our mouths. The truth is, we here at First Baptist Pulaski are imperfect people worshiping a perfect God. We hope the encounter you are about to have with Him puts a new song of praise in your mouth as well. And if you find yourself in our neck of the woods anytime soon, we would love to have you come worship, grow, and serve with us in person. Thank you so much for joining us. Sin is something you do against God or the Ten Commandments. God sent His one and only Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. Baptism is just showing the church that you know and believe in God. that God and Jesus are real and they love you and even though you do bad stuff, they love you anyway and they forgive you. We're in Isaiah chapter nine. We're gonna read uh, verses one through seven and please feel free if you need to, to uh, sit, just stand if you are able. Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan, and to Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time, and as they rejoice when dividing spoils. For you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. For the trampling boot of battle and the bloodied garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, the dominion will be vast, and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you during this time of worship, Lord, we pray that we have come with hearts that are filled with worship, Lord, that we have lived a life this week of worship and honor to you, just as you have designed us to be. But Lord, we pray that the things of this world and the things that distract us would melt away. And Father, that this just not be a scripture that we just read through, Father, or one that we recognize, but instead, Lord, we hear with new and fresh ears that the Holy Spirit would fill this place and fill us, Lord, in a way that we understand what you're trying to say through this passage. Lord, I pray that even right now, Father, as we come before you to sing and to glorify you, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be opened in new ways. Lord, help us to focus. Help us to come humble. Help us to come honest. And Lord, help us to come in a way, Father, where this 
is something we don't just hear, but we take with us and we do. Help us to be doers of your word, Lord. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for this time together. Lord, we thank you that we can come together to glorify the one who is the wonderful counselor. Lord, who is almighty God. Lord, bless our time together. Again, may you be part of everything we do here today for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, this is a product of Vacation Bible School. You may ask why we do Vacation Bible School. Why do we invest all the time, the effort, the, the finances, the, the long hours, the sweat, the tears? Uh, we do it for this very reason right here, for souls to be saved, lives to be changed, and for kids to take their faith public. It's so cool to see what God's doing in our kid ministry, and I hope you're excited uh, with what God is doing. But this is Sam Brindley, and this morning, Sam, he would like to say that he's nervous, but I'm not going to make him say that because he may faint in the water. Uh, but he's excited to be here today. And he's excited about uh, this opportunity, and he came and spoke with me a few weeks back about how he was uh, accepted the Lord Jesus Christ in Vacation Bible School through what Brother Aaron was teaching on and all that he was hearing that week. So we're excited about it. So Sam, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes, yes amen. I believe you have. Well, my brother, if you'll put your hands up there. I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in new life. Amen. Amen. We're excited. Sam, now that you have taken your faith public, now that you have shown the, the church here that, man, you've accepted Christ and you're excited, are you ready to take your faith and share it with those all around you? Yeah. Amen. Same question for you this morning, church family. Are you going to come alongside uh, Sam and help him in this journey and then also do the same thing, share the gospel with all those you can uh, around you each and every day? If you are, say amen. amen. If you would remain standing, we're going to join together and sing hymn number 175, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
flip over to 192, Mark the Herald King. pray. Heavenly Father, you are uh, the Almighty, uh, merciful, eternal, gracious, holy. We thank you for that. Uh, Father, we uh, come to you today and we do confess our sins to you. Uh, and we just thank you for, as uh, Big Bob Middleset would say, uh, forgiving us where we fail you. Uh, I love that. Father, uh, I pray that as we receive this offering today, that you will use 
uh, the money, the hearts of the folks who are giving it uh, for your kingdom, for your glory, uh, as you see fit. Uh, and, and with that in mind, uh, we have folks in Oaxaca, uh, our sister church in uh, Ohio. I do pray that they're uh, uh, being used by you is not in vain. Your word promises uh, that it won't be. And uh, I just ask that the Holy Spirit bear fruit in their lives uh, and that you are able to draw people uh, to yourself. Uh, Father, uh, I lift up our pastors uh, specifically. We have a few at this church, and I just lift them up, their families, their marriages, uh, keep them from the evil one. And uh, lastly, Father, I do lift up the lost. I mean, again, just sheer numbers alone. There, there are some people in the congregation who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior and uh, Master. And so I, I, I pray that this is the day that they realize that there is a no more blessed way of living than... Uh, living a life of dependence upon a covenant-keeping God. So we thank you, uh, Father God Almighty, for rescuing us from the domain of darkness and transferring us to the kingdom of your beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Some of you are thoroughly confused. You thought you went on vacation and you came back somehow in December. You don't know how that happened. Uh, you're sitting here and you're watching the screen and there's snow and you realize right now that it is so hot outside that you are praying for snow. Uh, it is almost warm enough in this room right now. I am praying for snow. And y'all don't have the hot lights on you. So uh, I think so. I'm not, I, I may lose a few pounds up here, which would not be a bad thing. So, but uh, it is kind of strange for us in July to be talking just a little bit about Christmas, right? Why? The industry that drives the animal that, that Christmas has turned in at some point, uh, I think we make jokes every year that I think sooner and sooner and sooner they're going to start talking about Christmas. So we're trying to get ahead of the toy companies and Hallmark and all this kind of stuff, and we're going to talk about Christmas in July before they start next month. Um, all joking aside, as believers, when we start thinking about Christmas, Christmas is the incarnation of God, the arrival of Jesus Christ. Every single day of our lives as believers, we should be celebrating Christmas because it is our hope. It represents Christ intersecting our lives, the world, and bringing about God's redemptive plan. And so we're going to take a look at a familiar passage in Isaiah chapter 9. You heard Aaron read that just a little bit earlier, and I appreciate him doing that for us as we entered into our service. But I want you to go ahead. Go ahead and be turning there. Take a look at it. We're going to be working our way through verses 1 through 7. And then hopefully it's going to challenge us to consider something significant about the person of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, as, as you're turning there, uh, one of the things that I would encourage you to do, Isaiah is one of those scary books, 66 chapters. It's a terrifying book at times. When you start reading it, your brain starts hurting because there's so much that's packed into it. Uh, but I would encourage you, as you have time, to read through it, to wrestle through it. Let the Holy Spirit illuminate what God is trying to say through the prophet Isaiah to his people at that time and then the reverberations of what that means for us because this message was originally intended for his people that were in a hot mess they were wrestling with a whole lot of stuff they were dealing with some things we're gonna step into verse one here in just a second but they were wrestling with a whole lot of things but what he was doing in dealing with them and promising to them was a promise that we were eventually going to see in the person of Jesus Christ. So have that in mind as we're kind of, kind of reading. Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, it says this, But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. By the way, just, just so you know a little bit of what's going on there. Those are some of the most northern tribes. So when the Assyrians were coming in, they were going to be the first ones that would feel the pinch. They were on the front lines of God's judgment because Israel was choosing not to walk after him. But in the latter days, he made glorious the way by the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, of them has light shined. They were in 
this difficult time to where they were in captivity. They were dealing with being pressed in on all sides. It felt like to them that God was being silent. But what he was promising here is the people that are walking in darkness will see a great light. Now, most of us have, that, have had that experience, that we have been wandering around the darkness at, at night trying to find a light switch. And that moment that we find that light switch and we're able to turn it on, there is something, it does something to us. We are, it, it illuminates what we need, and, and all of a sudden we can see exactly where we need to go. We have been in that moment where we were just looking for any amount of light, any amount of direction, anything that would help us to know that help was on the way. And in those moments, it seems like an eternity, doesn't it? And so for these folks, that's what they're dealing with. It seems like, where are you, God? What is going on? And he says, there is a great light that is coming because they're dealing with this captivity. Verse 3, it says, you have multiplied the nations. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as the joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoils. You have multiplied the nations. That's a little reminder for them that God is at work. How do we know? Because he promised way back in Genesis chapter 22, when he appeared as that flaming pot, as he appeared to Abraham, as he begins to deal with Abraham, as he tells him in, in chapter 22 of Genesis, I will make you a great nation. They will not be able to number your descendants. They will be as many as the sand on the seashore. The sand I am multiplying the nations. I am working through this. He is at work. It goes on in verse, verses 4 and 5, and listen to what it says. It says, For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as in the day of Midian. Verse 5, For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Now, we've all, probably at some point, seen a war movie. We've seen something. Now, some of you may not, and just, if you haven't, just, just you know, bear with us just for a minute. You've seen that, and it seems like at the darkest moment, there is a hero that, that comes. That's, that's, those are great movies. Uh, for some of you, it may have been, and, and I'll even go back. I, I know there's a lot of you guys that, that still read some of these, the Louis L'Amour books. There's always that hero that shows up just at the right time. In these old war movies, there's a hero that shows up just at the right time. Superhero movies, there's a hero that shows up just at the right time. And everything is set the way that it needs to. There's a picture here that there is one that is coming that is going to break the yoke of oppression. There is one that is coming that at the end, all that was used for war, garments rolled in blood, all the implements, all of these things will be set aside. There will no longer be a need for us to defend ourselves. There will be no need for us to worry because the enemies of God will all be defeated. There is coming that time. Now, as these people are hearing this prophecy, as they're hearing Isaiah talk, you imagine that they begin to get excited. They begin to be challenged. They begin to, to think, this is incredible. God, how are you going to do this? What are you going to do? So they begin to lean forward a little bit, if you imagine. You, you kind of get intrigued because what is going on? What's happening here? And we move in to verse 6 because there's something here that we've got to think about. There's temporal things, I imagine, that they're thinking about. Temporal is in like right now. The issues that they're dealing with. They're dealing with oppression from Assyria, from Babylon, from other groups. So eventually it's going to be the Persians. Eventually it's going to be the Greeks. Eventually it's going to be the Romans. It's going to add to and add to and add to. They're, they're right on the edge of this, but he's talking about not only temporal, but he's also talking about eternal. And then we step into the beginning of verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given. Now, if you back up just a couple of chapters, if you slide just back to chapter 7, Isaiah 7, 14, it says that to a virgin is going to be born a son, and his name will be called what? Emmanuel, or God with us. This is a reminder 
Remember what I just said a little, uh, just a little bit ago? This is it. There is a son that is going to be given. There's something powerful about this, that he's going to be God with us. Maybe in this moment you're sitting here thinking, and, and maybe you're wrestling with this a little bit, that God feels distant. Uh, I, I've unfortunately had the, a lot of conversations with folks. Not that I've had the conver- unfortunate with the conversations, but the heart behind it is, is that people feel like God is distant from them. They feel separated. Now, part of that has to do with, it's kind of interesting, um, when you do... When I do premarital counseling and we start talking about stuff, we talk about communication. We talk about relationship and developing a relationship. If I only hung out with Jennifer uh, every once in a while and really didn't spend a whole lot of time talking to her and all this kind of stuff, what do you think our marriage would be like? Part of the reason that we feel like that God is distanced from us is because we're really not spending any time cultivating a relationship with him. He's pursuing us, but we're so busy doing other things that we don't take the time to do that. Well, you know what? I show up on Sunday morning. Folks, if I just showed up for an hour a week to spend with my wife, how long do you think I would be married? How long do you think you would be married? For those of you that are not married right now, if you have a sugar booger and you only spend an hour a week, I promise you that sugar booger is not going to be your sugar booger very long. You know what I'm saying? It's like the old gentleman that sat down with the pastor. His wife was all upset. and he was with the, with, It says, Pastor, it says, my husband, on the day we got married, said, I love you. And that's the last time he said it. We've been married for 70 some odd years and we, he's never said it again. And he looks at the pastor and says, well, if I change my mind, I'll let her know. So, but that's, that's part of it is we operate that way sometimes in our relationship with God. Well, you know what? When I walk the aisle and I put my faith in him and I got baptized, all that kind of stuff, what else does he need from me? I declared, I'm yours. It's about a relationship because his desire is to know you. And that's part of what this is. A son is given so that we can be a part of something. Now, this is the part that, that is so beautiful. Then we move to the second part of verse 6. And the government. Now, when you say the government, most of us immediately go to Washington. We're not talking about this kind of government. We're not talking about a world government. What we're talking about is a rule, a righteous holy, supernatural rule. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. He shall be the foundation for everything that has to do with truth and righteousness. Everything is going to be built on him. And his name shall be called. Now, here we go. When you start thinking about this character, we are in this time that everywhere that you drive, what do you see related to what is going to take place the first part of August and in November? Every time you turn the television on, you try to watch some television or you open up the paper to read it or you get online, what are we inundated with? Campaign ads. Now, my favorite thing about campaign ads is is the ridiculousness sometimes of these campaign ads. Now, I'm talking about our, our national stuff. So I haven't seen anything local that was a little bit crazy. I'm sure there's probably some crazy stuff that's out there because people are wanting so badly to be in these positions that they will just about say anything at times. So... Got to be very, very careful because we do have politicians that are sitting in our, and, 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 our, and I don't want to get jumped when we, when we leave. So, um, but, I, but this is part of the problem. We see this, this stuff everywhere and we're inundated with this idea of government. We're inundated with this idea of what is it supposed to look like? Well, I, what these people stand for, I, I love this, especially at the national level. If you have watched anything whatsoever, even about our governor's race, you see the signs that it gives the qualifications of these people. There is never anything in there that is not generic about most everybody. Why? Because they want to identify with all of us. So they, they put this kind of stuff out. And then when you hear the negative ads, what are they doing? There's, they're, they're finding this one maybe little thing that's out there that they don't like. There's a comedian, Brian Regan, that talks about this, and I, and I love it. He said he literally saw a video one time, and it says that this so-and-so it was voted to tase seven-year-olds. Like that was the platform that this dude was, was running on. That is my desire. We want to tase seven-year-olds. It had to do with a, a rule so that if there was a child got a gun, they, they could not have to forcibly take it away from them, they, all this kind of stuff. They did all the research. This is what this guy, it was like a nominal little thing. But this is what he says. And so just imagine this guy's on the platform when he gets, when I get elected, I want to have a seven-year-old. And as soon as we do that, I'm going to tase him. That makes no sense whatsoever. But that's what we're, we're looking for qualifications. What is it that people are looking for? Well, here. God is going to give you the the foundation of what we're going to do is going to be built on this son that is given. Here are the qualifications. Here 
or what he's, this is what he's going to be called. This is going to be the characteristics of his rule. There are four things that are here. We're going to take a look at this. Most of us um, know this from the, from the old hymn. And sometimes because there is a breath break that is in there, we think that there's actually two words there. Because the, the song goes, wonderful, then counselor. But wonderful counselor actually is one thought. And so those two things are going to be together. So the first one is wonderful counselor. And he will be called wonderful counselor. Now the main thing that's being talked about here has to do with this idea of what is a counselor. Now we're going to talk about a little corollary to this in just a second. But a counselor, this is about a military or leadership role. A counselor, someone who is wise. Now the word wonderful here is not our understanding necessarily of wonderful. Man, that's really cool. It has to do with wonderful, supernatural. Think about this for a second. The person of Jesus Christ, what did he do? Some pretty significant things. You think about water into wine. You think about how he would, I think about Jairus' daughter. Jairus comes to him, they're on their way back. My, my daughter is sick. I need you to come and take care of her. Halfway up back on the trip, Jesus has to take care of something else. And one of his servants meets and says, don't bother the rabbi anymore. Your little girl's dead. Jesus looks at him and says, let's keep going. And he shows up. Don't worry, your daughter's just asleep. Now the paid mourners are already there. And they're crying and they're wailing and they're doing all the stuff that these paid mourners are supposed to do. And when he says this, they go into mocking Jesus. Jesus puts his hand on the girl and she rises. This is miraculous, wonderful counselor. There are those of you sitting in this room that have experienced the wonderful counselor. You have seen him do things that only he could do beyond what we are capable of doing, what only he could do. Another part of counselor, though, is, is this wise counsel that we're talking about. Something that makes somebody a wise counselor or a wonderful counselor is one that understands our situation. One that understands what we're going through. Anybody, if you've ever, if you've ever gone to somebody to, to talk to them, you're, you've been dealing with, with things, you just needed somebody that has been through what you have been through. It's part of the reason that we have Stephen ministry at the church, people that have gone through difficulty. I've had conversations with folks uh, recently that they've had children that have gone through difficult things. Hey, look, if you know of somebody else that has had a kid go through this, let me know because I would love to sit down with them. Why is that powerful? Because they know what you are feeling. When I have people, I was very blessed. When Jennifer first started getting sick, we were in Texas. Our senior pastor lost his wife to MS. And I was walking with Homer during this time when his wife got very sick. Dorothy, every opportunity she had, she opened up her mouth with nurses, doctors, whoever, and she was proclaiming the gospel. She was talking about it consistently, but I watched how Homer walked with her. And that has encouraged me. There are things that there are times that I will still talk to Homer and ask him as we're walking through stuff, how did you handle this? How did you balance ministry and dealing with, with this kind of stuff? How do you do those things? Do you know why I talk to him? Because he's been through it. We have a high priest who has been through it. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 14, it says, Since then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Listen. You think about what Jesus endured. You think about what he dealt with. This is a man that understood what it was for prayers not to be answered in the garden. Father, if there's any other way, not my will, but yours. And the Lord knew that was not what was going to happen. He was not going to be delivered to redeem the world a different way. He was going to have to go down the road that he had to. He understands what it is to be abandoned in a time of need. He understands that. These men that had walked with him, one betrayed him and the other 11 scattered. One that was one of his closest denied him. 
You heard Brother Tony say in his sermon last week, they trumped up charges. They even, the son of God was referred to as the son of Belial or the son of, or the Lord of flies, the son of the devil. He knows what it was to hurt. Physically, mentally, emotionally. He understands that. He is a wonderful counselor. That's a huge, beautiful qualification of who he is. He knew what was necessary as a wise counselor. He knew exactly what we needed for redemption. The only opportunity that we had, he understood that. The second one here, it says, mighty God. This idea here has to do with this idea is he is capable. He is able. He is mighty. There is nothing more humbling than watching somebody that has abilities beyond yours work. If you've ever fancied yourself an artist and you've watched somebody that is a true artist, you're like going, man, I, I might as well be drawn with crayon. If you have ever watched an athlete and you thought, man, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. I have this experience on a regular basis when I go to the gym. I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And then there's some dude that comes in and I'm just like going, okay, I'm just going to go over here in the corner and hide. I mean, it's... It's amazing what you want. This past week, I had the privilege of, of being with uh, Richland's football team at FCA camp. I watched some quarterbacks do some stuff that I'm like, holy shnikes, how did they do that? I watched some linemen do some things, and I'm like, how did they do that? These are guys that right now could probably play at Division One. It doesn't mean that we are incapable. It just means that God is more capable. It puts us in perspective. It helps us to understand that he is beyond capable. We think we can do things on our own. But there is a God that is out there that is bigger. And this is what he's revealing about who Christ is. He is the mighty God. He is significant. He is impressive. We should be humbled and in awe of his power and his strength. All that we think that we have figured out, all that we think that we're capable of, pales in comparison to who he is. Unfortunately, we live in a time where more and more people, I can handle this on my own. And I'm not talking about people that are standing on the outside. I'm talking about those of us as believers. We are trying to marshal our lives on our own. And what we are left with is a mess because we are trying to do what only the mighty God can do. We've got six of our folks from our church specifically that are in Oaxaca right now. They cannot accomplish what God wants them to do outside of the mighty God. CB building. Eric Clarkson right now, they're working on some things specifically connected to some backyard Bible club type things called their Kids Village. In the fall, they're hoping to roll out their student version of that. And uh, Jake Brown is going to be doing that. Tiffany, um, and I just lost Tiffany's last name right now. Tiffany's going to be working uh, with, with the kids. But Eric and I had a conversation this past week, and one of the things that he said, and I thought that it was so, it so resonated with this statement, is he says, we need God to get us to where we need to be. We are in need of Him. Because He is the mighty God. We read the passage last week, Philippians 2. Verses 5 through 11. Let this attitude be in you that is in Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be held onto, but made himself low. This is the great God of heaven that emptied himself into a man. We're talking about the person of Jesus Christ here that emptied himself. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, how does the rest of that go? There's nothing my God cannot do. A lot of us that grew up in church, maybe we sang that song. There's nothing my God, but we don't live that way. Our ability, what He does, transcends what we need, not only here, but in eternity. The next one, the everlasting Father. Your translation may say the eternal Father everlasting Father. This is a little bit of a, a nod that helps us understand that He is co-eternal with the Father. It is kind of interesting that He used the word Father here, but this is a little bit that He and the Father are one. If you go back and you take a look at John chapter 14 and other places, this is a reminder of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are one. These are not three separate entities. They are one. And they operate in conjunction. There's unity 
within them. And this is a reminder about that, the everlasting Father. Jesus doesn't show up at Christmas. He is pre-existent. He is co-eternal with the Father. And if He's doing that, what does that say? It says that He is trustworthy. He is trustworthy. He is powerful. He is unchanging, which means that what He does has significance because it doesn't change It is an eternal fix. It is not a temporal fix. It is not a moment. It is not a gashing wound with a band-aid on it. This is dealing with real life change. This is who he is. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it goes on in verse 9 and it says, Do not be led astray by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by food. Food lasts for a little while. Some of y'all had breakfast today. More than likely, you will eat lunch in just a little bit. If you were in second service somewhere around 11 o'clock, it's when people start getting a little wiggly because they're afraid the Methodists are going to beat them to church, or beat them, beat them to, 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 to legends to eat. So we're worried about, we, we got to go eat, we got to go eat, we got to eat because we're hungry. Because it only lasts for a little while. What he's talking about, the everlasting Father will satisfy us for eternity. All that we need, everything that we need, nothing that's outside of him. Then we get to the last qualification. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now the idea of Prince here, I don't want you to have the idea of, well, he's second in command. Again, we just talked about that he's the everlasting father. He's connected to the Godhead. He's co-eternal with the father. This is Prince of Peace is not a position. This is not like Prince Harry that eventually will ascend to the throne. That's not how this, this works. That's not what this is talking about. Prince has to do with the leader, ruler, authority. He is going to be the one that issues in peace. Now, as we watch television... As again, as we look at our apps on our phones, we, we take a look at news. We see turmoil. Folks, I'm not even talking about war. War is this horrific thing that we see all over the planet where you have man killing man. But what we begin to see too is as we begin to see strife within people that there should be no strife. And we're going to get really close to home. There is strife at times within the church that has no place in the church because Jesus is not our Prince of Peace. We don't allow Him to be. We let other things be more important than the Prince of Peace. Let what He has rule in our hearts. I love this. Peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is connected to that word grace. Grace means that when conflict shows up, that we love each other enough that it transcends the moment of difficulty to the Prince of Peace. We go back to that Ephesians passage that talks about that our unity is in Christ. It's not in all us thinking the same way, doing the same things. We all have different ideas. But it's when it becomes about us and not about Him It's when we lose sight of what really matters and allows us to do, because it's his qualification as our leader, and that should call us to something. That should call us this beautiful thing of peace that is not of this world. It's not of us. He's saying, and this is in that, uh, when he's sitting in the upper room and he's sharing with his guys, these guys are, the the disciples are very disoriented. They don't understand everything that's, that's saying, and this is one of the statements that he makes. John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The peace that I'm going to give is a lasting peace. It's not as the world gives, because it depends on man, and man is fickle. But mine is an everlasting peace. And what's beautiful about this is is that it moves on into verse 7. Of the increase of his government... And of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice, with righteousness, for this time, forth and forevermore. That lasting, and how is this accomplished? The zeal of the Lord will do this. This is something that is significant. God is the one that is redeeming his people. It's not that we are doing it somehow. We don't do it by 
working hard and, and making sure we do everything just right and making sure that everybody that are, are connected to churches or connected to ministries or whatever are happy and comfortable and, and enjoying. Is it good? And we just want to know. We just want to make sure that we serve you better. It's not about this. It's not about our comfort. It's not about us. It is about Him. It is the zeal of the Lord that's going to do all of this. It's His desire for us to redeem His creation. This is how much our Heavenly Father loves us that He was willing to send His Son to die in our place. Let me make it personal. He sent Jesus to remove Rodney Hawkins' stupidity, my sin, my pride, my selfishness, my arrogance, my thinking that it's about me, my sometimes being bigger being too big for my britches, all that kind of stuff. He sent all of that stuff to remove all of that stuff, to pay the penalty for my sin. It was God that did that. There's nothing I could do. I was destitute. I was removed. I was standing on the outside going, please let me in, and there was nothing I could do to get there. It was only when I humbled myself before the Lord. 18-year-old kid that had been in church nine months before I was breathing air. I was there every time the doors were open. But that was not significant enough for salvation. It was only because the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, the Mighty God, the Wonderful Counselor, met me where I was on April 25th, 1993, and rescued me from death and hell because of His work, not mine. There is something powerful about this. Now you're sitting here going, yes, Rodney, that's awesome. Let's sing and go. I, I, I feel really excited. See, here's the thing that we kind of wrestle with sometimes is we forget that this passage, this word, this holy breathed out word of God is supposed to call us to do something. Not just to be excited, but to do something something listen to what isaiah chapter 49 verse 6 says he says this is god speaking it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of jacob and to bring back the preserved of israel i will make you a light he's talking about jesus here i will make you a light for the nations that my salvation shall reach the ends of the earth the reason that we have this is to remind us of a few things. The first one is, is that it should energize our worship. It should remind us of who God is and what he has done. And we can't help but worship. As you begin to think about some of the songs that we sang, we sing those at Christmas. I mean, sometimes I think when we sing them at Christmas, they're connected to Christmas holiday tradition and not to the great theology that are in those songs. Who He is. It should energize the fact He is worthy of our worship because of what He has done. We brag on, man, if we go eat somewhere good, we won't tell everybody about it. Man, I ate, you, oh, you got it. We go on a great vacation, what do we want to do? We want to tell everybody about our vacation. Oh, you, oh, you just got to know, we, we went, we stayed here, we ate here, we did this. It was incredible. If our kids do something, if our parents do something, if somebody has significance in our life, that we want to tell everybody about that. If we go see a movie, we want to tell everybody about that. If something significant happens in our lives, we want to tell everybody about that. We want to talk about those things because we're excited about them. But for some reason, it seems like when we come to worship, it's like, hmm. I feel for Alex sometimes because when he looks out, I just wonder, is he looking at the face that I sometimes have when I'm sitting right there? And I'm a, the words are coming out, but I'm asleep at the wheel. Does it energize my worship to know, man, I'm walking into the room and I get an opportunity to worship the great God of heaven? It should also solidify our faith. There's moments where our faith gets shaken. There's moments where we're going through difficulty. There's moments where we're questioning who God is. There's moments where we're just questioning everything about what all this looks like. And in moments like this, when we begin to read passages like this, it should remind us, yes, I know who God has said that he is. I know how Christ has revealed himself. I know that the Holy Spirit is present. I know that if this is the truth, then I can stand in this truth. So our faith is not in 
the changing situations that we're in. It's not in our comfort level. It's not in anything other than the security of the truth of God's Word that He reigns supreme. He has authority over all. Then the last, it should challenge our ministry and our missions. It should challenge us to consider, I can't just be a spectator in this whole thing. I can't just, like we talked about going back to the beginning, I can't just every once in a while go, God, you're awesome. We can't just show up and every once in a while kind of do something to walk through. We cannot feel like that as the offering class by, if we drop money in, we've done all that God has called us to do. That and more. He has called us. Now, some of you are right now, okay, Rodney, you're trying to drum up volunteerism in the church. Well, you know what? I would love for more folks to be involved. I would love for us to have folks climbing all over themselves going, how can I serve the Lord? I think we as a church are in a process of going through our committees. Uh, we as a staff, uh, you, our deacons, we are praying through how to do less better. How do we make sure that what we are doing is what God has called us to do? And we don't get distracted by doing things that we want to do, but what God has called us to do. And we're wrestling through that. And that's difficult because when we start doing that, sometimes we end up not doing some things that we've done for a very long time. And sometimes we have new ideas and we go, you know what, that sounds really cool, but I just don't know that that's something that God's calling us to do. We're constantly wrestling through and praying and waiting for God to open up those doors. And sometimes we step out and we try things and we fall on our faces and God picks us up and then we keep going because it is God that is ordering our steps. We're working as hard as we can as a church to get to where we need to get to. But here's the thing. This is really more about individually are we engaging in how God could use us where he has us planted. Each one of us that names the name of Christ has a ministry and a mission field that God has called us to. And it will be places that me as a pastor in this church, as the other guys that are on staff in this church, each one of us, we will never be able to go because we are not you. And as long as we keep thinking, well, that's somebody else's responsibility, then we are missing what this is. Why would we not be engaged? If it is the zeal of the Lord that is doing this, if he is passionate about this, we should be passionate about doing it. Maybe that means you need to get on a plane and go to Oaxaca. Maybe that means right where you work, where you go to school, in your family, you need to be living and sharing the gospel. But it should be something that is a daily part of your life and my life. And if it's not, then we have to consider, are we really running after the Lord the way that we need to? He is pursuing us, but are we pursuing Him? Beth is going to come and she's going to play the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Do we see Him that way? The connection that we have to Him. The love that He has for us. Do we share that with other people? Do we walk in a way so people can see who we are? So the words that come out of our mouths, the way that we live, gives testimony to who He is. In just a moment, we're going to open up, up the altar. She's just going to play. We're not going to sing. God will meet you right where you are. There's nothing significant about this, but there is something significant about God's Word dwelling in our lives and us responding and doing something with it. Please don't leave today just going, it was really cool to get to read that passage. It's one of my favorite passages. It was really cool to get to, to, to think about how great our God is. What is He calling us to? His desire is for you to walk in grace with Him, to walk in redemption with Him. And He's provided all of this through His Son, Jesus Christ. Right where you are, bow your head, you can close your eyes, you can come to the front, whatever you want to do, respond as the Lord leads.